I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by Gary Stephenson, an aerospace systems engineer with wide-ranging industry experience at organizations including NASA, United Technologies, Lindquest, Boeing, ITT, and Hughes Aircraft Company. Gary's had a deep interest in gravity modification and advanced propulsion for decades, and he's published numerous scientific articles on various topics, especially related to the detection and generation of high-frequency gravitational waves. Gary is also a well-established contributor to many authoritative scientific papers by other researchers and is a past participant in notable advanced propulsion conferences such as the 2003 MITRE HFGW and 2005 to 2008 ISNPS STAFE Section F conference events. So Gary, welcome, sir. You have a presentation for us on the top researchers in the field of high frequency gravitational waves, along with some background info on past workshops in this area. So without any further ado, let's jump right into that. Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much, Tim, for having me on again. Uh, it's always a pleasure and thank you for the kind introduction. So the context of this, I'm, I'm gonna limit it just because uh, in the interest of time, there's a lot of uh, people who work in high frequency gravitational waves, a lot of them have gone to the STAFE conferences. Uh, I'm just going to focus for now on the people that are involved with um, the, the core international high frequency gravity wave workshops. There's only been three of them so far. The 2003 that was the MITRE one you alluded to, MITRE organized it, it was in McLean, Virginia. Earth Tech organized one in 2007 that was held in Austin. And then there was a third organized by Chengdu University, and that was held in Chengdu, China. Uh, why did I get involved with high frequency gravity waves? I'm not, I'm not sure I ever explained this to you, Tim, but it was because I was, I've worked on a number of different, uh, I've, I've worked as a contractor for most of my career. I've worked on Army, Navy, and Air Force programs. But the reason I got involved with high frequency gravity waves was because of a Navy program, I was pulled in on a proposal for an improvement to the E6 program. The improvement was AWD, sorry, the AW, ADWS, ADWS, and where the WS is wire system. And the, and the mission of the E6 is to talk to submarines, uh, even if they're submerged. And how they talk to submarines when they're submerged is with extremely low frequency signals that can pass through water. To get an ELF radio to pass through water, they have to literally unspool a kilometers long cable out the back of the aircraft, fly around in a circle and create a, a little bit of a spiral antenna out of this trailing wire. So that wire system was, was part of the potential upgrades for this ADWS upgrade that I was, I was working on the proposal for. I was the system engineer on that proposal. And I thought, my gosh, there has to be a better way than dragging this big long cable out of the back of an aircraft. What about gravitational waves? Because they could potentially go right through water and they could be picked up wherever and it doesn't matter how deep the sub is, you can still talk to a sub with, with high frequency gravitational waves. So that's how I got involved in it. Uh, I, it was just a personal interest. It was never part of the proposal, uh, but I did start researching and I ran across Bob Baker's work, which he had been a very uh, strong advocate for developing this technology. And so I started corresponding with him. And at one point he said we were gonna to put together a conference on this. And it was about 2002 when we were planning on it for next year. And was there somebody else at Boeing that was working on this that he could talk to? And I'm like, sorry, Bob, I'm like literally the only person at Boeing that is really interested in this. So he's like, okay, well then you're it. So come on out. So he invited me to the first international high frequency gravitational wave workshop in McLean. And that is how I physically met him. I had not met him before that time. I had no idea who he was. I had no idea what his background was. And his co-chair was Paul Murad, another guy I had absolutely no clue. I had never met either one of them before and didn't even think to investigate them or find out what they were about. As far as I was concerned, they were just really into gravitational waves. So I went to the conference and had a chance to meet them both. And as the, the first one I wanted to introduce is Paul Murad. He has passed away uh, recently. Here he's pictured on the right with a identifying flat out, identified flying object. And, and Tim, you knew him too, right? When did you meet him? 
Yeah. Uh, so I, you know, I've known Paul Murad since 2003 or 2004 and about the same time frame. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I, I absolutely love Paul. I mean, he was really like a second father in so many ways, you know, and he, I, I would say, I mean, just my thoughts on him were Paul was such an inspirational figure, not just for high frequency gravitational waves, mm -hmm. but for all sorts of innovative new technology ventures, right? I mean, he was he was co-chair of the 2003 conference. He was also um, one of the, the Section F chair, right, from 2005 right, to 2008. Yeah, always a chair for Steve, yep. Yeah. Yeah, and he, he was never afraid to go to bat for ideas that he thought were valid, and he was always there for people who needed help. I mean, he was just an, an absolutely wonderful, he was a wonderful scientist and also an amazing human being. Another advocate for high tech, right, for cutting edge technologies and for yeah, R&D, yeah. cutting edge technologies. And his other role, I think probably his day job, uh, which I did not know at the time when I joined uh, the HFGW conference was, I, I think his day job was Defense Intelligence Agency, right? So he investigated things that looked pretty high tech that we didn't quite understand. And I remember him mostly for all the scary movies and stories he would tell. He had a lot of interesting background. And I think he probably stretched the limits of the rules in presenting them to us. Oh, I'm I'm sure that he did. But, you know, after hours also, I mean, you know, he... For, for all of the work that he did, he would go home after hours and go through scientific papers and help yeah. authors draft those and correct errors. And he would review scientific calculations to publish them in various journals. So that was that was his after hours project. He would spend, I mean, literally hours on this every single night, just helping people he had never met get published in journals. So, yeah. you know, again, just a tremendous figure. Yeah, a fantastic advocate for cutting edge science. Uh, and then there was Bob Baker himself. I did not know anything about Bob either before I met him and got to know him. Um, what, but his, his career is astonishingly long. Um, when I was busy getting born in 1958, he was being featured in Glamour magazine as a space doctor. He was literally the first one to graduate from UCLA with a PhD in space navigation. He, he was one of the ones that calculated the orbital dynamics that got us to the moon. Uh, and uh, the, I have uh, another uh, picture here for the for the audio version. I can describe uh, Bob Baker with with his new wife uh, Bonnie in her mink coat, dressed up because they are at an awards dinner. He's receiving a service award, uh, and the MC that that is hosting it uh, is somebody named Ronnie Reagan, who is just coming up a, a young buck, and later on would it would work out for him to be governor and president. So uh, Bob, Bob is of the age where he had Ronnie Reagan MC for him. <laughs> yeah. Well, and Bob, uh, it, it, Bob is still around, right? And yes. oh yeah, mm -hmm. and, yeah. And, I, I, we're personal friends, and we stayed at their Palm Springs house. They hosted us at their Palm Desert house uh, last yeah. year when we were visiting LA. Now, Bob, I, I don't, I, I don't want to jump ahead, but Bob got into this through Dr. Robert Forward, right? Uh, actually, um, Bob was Bob was involved with this uh, a lot longer than that, as it turns out. He he was uh, on one of the panels for uh, Project Blue Book, was an Air Force project that was looking into unexplained aerial phenomena, uh, and that that was way back in the '60s. And I don't know that he personally testified to Congress, but his panel did uh, per, uh, personally uh, testified to Congress on the findings of Project Blue Book. And he did give me the advice one time, if you really want to destroy your career, don't forget to work on UFOs, because that, if anything, can do it. Uh, I think he meant it a little bit tongue in cheek, but not entirely. <laughs> yeah, well, I was, think, I, you know, I think UFOs are still, they, they are still career destroying to this day, right? Yes, so. I mean, so. <laughs> and then the uh, lovely picture uh, there with Bonnie, I think the, the upper picture, 2005, was when he was turning 90. And the lower picture was 2021 when he was turning 90. So not quite clear on his age. Maybe he stretches the truth on it a little bit, but I'm glad he's he's still hanging around and, and he's still with us. And I, I literally corresponded with him a couple of days ago by email. Uh, who else was there was Ning Li. And Ning Li is, is a, a folk hero or at least uh, a topic of many, many swirling rumors over the years and decades. She presented there at uh, the first HFGW workshop, 
and she had been funded by NASA to do some uh, gravitational research. And then she seemed to disappear. And there were all kinds of rumors that, well, maybe she went back to China, or maybe she got kidnapped, or maybe she got arrested, or who knows. But it turned out she had been working on a program that was apparently some kind of a black program or dark program off the record for many, many years. And when she did finally pass away, she was still right there in Huntsville, Alabama. And I think that wasn't too long ago, was it, Tim? I mean, I think you've reported on this. You know, I did some follow up on this last year and I didn't find a lot of recent stuff on her, but I was able to talk to her team members. And one of the things that they shared was they hadn't heard from her. I, I'm guessing from the length of this entire this dark program that she was working on, um, they had they had talked about working with her a lot in the 1990s. And at right around the time that she had a lot of media. Right. She, yes. she kind of disappeared. And that was the time when they quit corresponding with her. So there was Douglas Tor, and then there was one other fellow, and I forgot his name. And I, I spoke with both of them, and they they really said that their interactions with her, their their work with her, ended around that time. So, oh, okay. yeah, I, you know, it, it's it's interesting that you found a lot after that. That's that's all news to me. Yeah, well, I um, actually, I know the fellow at, at NASA Marshall Space Flight Center that funded her work. His name was Ron Kozar, and he was a former manager of mine on a weather satellite program at ITT in Fort Wayne, Indiana. So that's in the small world category of, no, I know a person who knows a person. <laughs> uh, also there, uh, Hal Puthoff could not be there. We'll talk about Hal in a second. But he did send one of his employees, Eric Davis. Since that time, I had no idea, by the way, when I met Eric Davis, who he was. And all I knew was this crazy guy came up and started talking to me about cold fusion. And I thought, okay, I need to excuse myself. He's obviously completely nuts. And he talks very rapidly and very loudly because he has tendonitis. So it's like he wants to get the conversation over before his ears start ringing in again. And so he strikes you as this very energetic, very powerful, uh, but very quirky person. But since that time, he has, of course, settled down into an amazing career, uh, general relativity design. He's actually worked for Hal on designing uh, physical, physically realizable wormholes. So he's, he's uh, very talented in general relativity. Not only that, but he has done some disclosures and talked maybe more than he should. And he's extremely famous now in terms of the UFO and UAP culture, and he should to the point where I, I've seen him on, on TV, to the point where he might need his own TV channel, right? I mean, he's yeah. not <laughs> and, and you know, I, I I shouldn't toot my own horn here. I I took that photo, that photo that's in the main. That's and that's the, my. I was wondering about that because the piece of furniture he's sitting on looks like a sort of New Mexico style that you would. Yes, see. that was at the state conference. And so I was going to ask you that, Tim. So you beat me to the punch. Is that your photo? Yeah, you know, one of the things that interested me about Eric was he, and I, I remember this from the Stafe conference, so he did the first derivation, he basically did uh, the Alcubierre warp drive in higher dimensional, higher dimensional brain space, and wow. what interested me about that was that was one of the very first papers in applied string and brain theory ever published, and it was the Alcubierre warp drive, so. You never think that'd be an area of applied physics, right? Yeah, it's like I, cosmology or something, or you know, but not not applied physics. So that's quite impressive. So Eric, Eric was there too, uh, as well as Nick Cook. Uh, the the uh, HFTW workshops have been extremely uh, gifted at keeping out journalists. Uh, Nick was the one exception. He managed to get in the door. Um, I think they they were they were trying to um, limit the audience because we were gonna be discussing a lot of free willing ideas and we didn't want it to get taken out of context. Uh, and so they were a little reluctant, I think, to let Nick in and said something about, oh, it might take clearances or, you know, and that wasn't a classified conference, but Nick's like, yeah, I actually have all the clearances. So it was like, can I call somebody or can I call a guy? And so he made some calls to people in the UK who made some calls to the US and they're like, okay, reluctantly opened the door for him. So he was able to get in and cover this. He's, for those who don't know him, a, a longtime journalist with uh, Jane's Defense Weekly. So he has done uh, decades of defense uh, journalism. And then he retired from that and started becoming an author, wrote The Hunt for Zero Point, which was 
an expose of some of the work that the Nazis were doing and how it may or may not have been carried over into what the rest of the world is doing now. We were all very disappointed to read the book and find out HFGW was not anywhere in the book. So I teased him a little bit about that. I read the grid, same problem. <laughs> the grid's a completely different subject though. You, you, know, you know, and in Nick's case, the thing that interests me about Hunt for Zero Point, I, I, I really feel like um, as he got into that community and he started learning about it, you know, he was already writing the book and he had kind of his story theme laid out. And I, I always felt like he learned more after. So if he ever does a sequel to it, I'm sure that HFGW is going to be very prominent in that. But you know, I have seen an interview of, with him on this topic since that time. And I would have to agree with you. I mean, the, the interview I saw with him was much more, which I think is only a couple of years old, which much more illuminating uh, than, you know, than discussing the, this, this with him before, before he attended uh, the conference. So... Yeah, uh, I mean, Nick, the, the thing that, that struck me about that was he, he almost became like a lightning rod, right? Where, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, people were just giving him information after that book came out. And I, I'm sure that on some level, he was kind of like, why did I write the end to this thing when I've got so much more? So, you know, he's he's primed for a sequel now. Yeah, and, and Nick was, it, he, he came over when I was doing lifters, actually. I have photos of him in my garage. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. I didn't realize you met him during the lifter era. Yep. Yep. He, yeah. They flew out with a TV crew because he did a couple of different specials. I and, TV crew, but I think the TV crew I was involved with didn't include Nick. Yeah. The, the, yeah. There were, there was a lot, there were a lot of, a lot of media interest back then. Era. Yeah. In that, in that era. Uh, so that, that was kind of uh, the group for the first one. Uh, go forward about four years and now it's 2007. And there was an, there was a need uh that was felt for a follow-up. Uh, one, of, one of the issues was that the Chinese from China had been barred from the first international high-frequency gravitational workshop because of SARS. There was a SARS outbreak, and for some reason, we're really nervous about outbreaks coming from China. I don't I know. What's <laughs> but that was the feeling in 2003, and we were terrified SARS was gonna spread around the world and become this giant epidemic, and so no, no SARS was allowed to get out of China. That's yeah, that could never, that could never happen. That could never happen in real life, right? So they were allowed to attend in 2007 uh, in this really unfriendly looking building. It looks like it might be a meth lab. Uh, didn't have any, any labels of any kind. Uh, I guess I'm getting it mixed up with Albuquerque. Uh, we had windowless um, labs in there and windowless offices. And in the core, these windowless uh, conference rooms that when you're in them, you felt like you were on the set of Severance, if you've ever seen that TV show. It's just, uh, it reminded me a lot of like working on a government art program. There's no, never any windows and there's no time. Uh, and so you're in there and if we go around the room, it's pretty fascinating that there's this contingent of Americans. There are four Americans there, uh, four Chinese and Rodeco's gotten out of a seat, but two Russians as well. So for whatever reason, and it struck me as odd even at the time, the world superpowers decided this is something they want to work on together. So there was probably more to the high frequency gravitational wave work than met the eye, number one. Uh, number two, uh, at the head of the table, and I'm not sure it's really clear in this picture, it'll be clear in following pictures, uh, sat uh, Hal Puthoff and Kit Green. Hal Puthoff and Kit Green are famous people, but not for gravity. They're famous people because they're like the men who stared at ghosts. They're third eye spy. They're like into so many remote viewings and paranormal things that it's like just meeting these people and having them in the room is like weird. But that they, they were leading the conference struck me as especially strange because these are not gravitational experts, right? These are experts in the unexplained. These are like X-File guys, essentially. I mean, to put it into simple terms. So we have these X-File guys throw in a party for the world's superpowers on gravitational waves. It's a head scratcher. Uh, here's another one. Rodenko is in this picture next to Leonid. Leonid Grischuk and Rodenko there are the Russian components. Um, Hal, sitting across from Hal. The other person that was missing from the picture is uh, Giorgio Fontana, the, the sole uh, European at this conference, represented uh, the Europeans and in, in particular the Italians. Uh, we'll talk about a little bit more about him. Uh, and then uh, probably 
covered up in this view because we have these sub windows uh, in the way. Standing behind us is Eric Davis. So Eric Davis did pop in and out uh, for Hal and was assisting Hal at this conference. Uh, there, speaking of Hal, here's a picture of Hal on the left with Eric Davis. And I think his name is uh, Lewis, is that right? He's an A-tip guy? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Alon Alonzo or something like that? L Lou Elizondo, yeah. It was Lou Elizondo, yeah. Uh, and so uh, this was an aspect of the conference I did not understand at the time that ATIP actually funded it. I, I didn't know where the money came from, but as it turns out, the funding had come from ATIP for this conference. So uh, these, these three guys were all associated with ATIP program. Uh, Al there at his desk, probably with some secret Air Force sub space station there on the picture. And associated also with Kit Green in his investigation of unexplained aerial phenomena. So here's a guy who's running our gravitational wave conference that is seriously into UAPs, right? Don't know quite what the connection is quite yet. Kit Green, another one, whose day job is, is working for three-letter uh, outfits that look into new poisons coming out of Russia, who also looks into the paranormal, and whose side gig is apparently shoulder surfing people like Bob Baker on gravitational waves. And so he was there uh, and he was in the room the entire time continuing to remind us, hey, it's great that the Chinese and Russians are here working with us, but please don't talk about anything like radar absorbing materials or stealth technology or anything that like would be like government stuff. Please just keep it on gravitational waves. So he was, he, he had the dual role of, of co-chair and also chief political officer. I think all three contingents had someone like that following along as a reminder, and that was Rodinko's part-time job, was keep an eye on Leonid. Leonid, by this time, had already left uh, uh, Soviet Union for Cardiff and had a chair at Cardiff University in the UK, and whose daughter later on moved to the US uh, in Pennsylvania. Uh, speaking of Leonid, here is Leonid, certainly from a point of view of gravitational waves, the most famous scientist there. Uh, friends, obviously, with Kip Thorne, uh, picture on the left, and with Stephen Hawking, picture on the right, who was maybe uh, wondering about Leonid's fashion choices, looking at his shirt. <laughs> you know, it looks like that was the 1980s era, though. That that does yeah. look vaguely familiar, so. Yeah, yeah. So maybe those clothes were okay in the 80s. I, don't know. I, I won't admit to having any of those shirts, but. <laughs> anyway, some great photos of Leonid, who, uh, who goes way back in cosmology and did his PhD thesis on the possibility that the Big Bang created uh, primordial not only primordial black holes, but primordial gravitational waves. So he was the first to predict that the Big Bang probably created gravitational waves that can we can still detect if we had a high frequency gravitational wave detector. And finally, uh, the head of the uh, Chinese contingent, Fang Yu Li, uh, who Bob Baker essentially pulled out of obscurity. To say Fang Yu Li was obscure was really an understatement. I mean, nobody in the world knew about his work. So I do not know what kind of Google Scholar algorithm or intelligence community um, big data found this work, but somehow Bob got wind that this there is a remarkable, astonishing paper being written by this person in China, and please talk to him about it. Uh, and so uh, it was highlighted to Bob. Bob sent it out for review. He sent it to me, and when I got it, I was astonished because there's like a Faraday force and there's a Lorentz force in electromagnetism. The Faraday force makes sense, it's, it's linear and it causes charges to get pulled or pushed. The Lorentz force is a little weirder. Lorentz force is like, if there's a B field and there's a charge going through the B field, the charge velocity is in one direction and the B field is in the second direction. The Lorentz force is in the third direction. It's like, that's, that's not how everyday physics works in my mind. I mean, if you, if you kick a soccer ball, it doesn't go straight up it goes in the direction you kick it. But the Lorentz force works on this weird orthogonal system. Well, essentially what Fang Yu Li did was instead of the Gerstenstein effect, which was the last time anybody predicted that a gravitational wave would create a photon or a photon would create a gravitational wave. Uh, Gerstenstein said it could, it, it could happen if you're traveling through a magnetic field. Fang Yu Li took it one step further and said, actually, if you're traveling through an electric field and orthogonal to that is a magnetic field, 
you will get a graviton if your photon was flowing that way. Mm. Or you will get, sorry, you will get a photon kicking out on that third dimension if a graviton is flowing through that way. That, that was new physics. And nobody expected that out of Einstein's uh, general relativity equations. But they are tensors. The space time, the shape of space time is, you know, related to the stress energy, the momentum and energy and mass of the system. And the changing of that will, will change uh, space time. So he, he, he went through that tensor analysis and pulled this result out. And he's literally the first one to do it. And it was astonishing work. And we are still grappling with that discovery. Finally, Giorgio Fontana. Uh, Giorgio was there because he works more at the quantum level, or at least that, that was the reason he was, he was there. And it was talking about a stimulated emission of gravitons, which is essentially a gazer, a gravitational laser. Uh, and so I think he was there for the first stage of DW to talk about um, this gravitational laser idea that if you put energy to two disparate kinds of uh, superconductors at the junction, they can create gravitons, and they can emit gravitons. And, and he had that paper written, that result. But since that time, subsequently to that, at Stafe and other conferences, he has co-written papers with Paul Murad and Bob Baker on other topics associated with gravitation and with uh, uh, space propulsion. So uh, the turkey gets talked not at the conference, but after the conference, of course, is when all the really interesting discussions happen. So uh, Bob, of course, talking to Feng Yu about physics the political officers having a chat about politics, uh, and then the, the executives talking about funding programs uh, was all represented on that boat. Uh, and the wives got to come. So Bonnie, Bonnie was there, and Nancy was there, and uh, Ileana was there, Rodenko's wife. So, so people who had wives that were willing to travel were able to bring their wives. Uh, and so I, th I thought that was, that was pretty fun. Uh, they all kind of hovered around Leonid because he's the most charming of any of us. Uh, and so you'll see that if, if you have the, the video version of this. And, uh, and Ileana would also approach Nancy and, and Bonnie to see if she could buy some American ladies shoes. And so they were, they were pretty shocked because of course there is no such thing as American made ladies shoes. There's only Italian and Chinese knockoffs. It was an international incident when they were not able to find any American made shoes for Ileana. Uh, it, it continued for quite a while, and um, it got to the point where Bob was telling stories again. Um, sometimes they're, they're funny stories about diplomats he knows making gaffes uh, or scientists, or you know maybe they're stories about uh, Buzz Aldrin. He's friends with Buzz Aldrin, and uh, I met Buzz Aldrin one time at their at their house at a cocktail party at the house. They had, they had at the time this sprawling five you know five story five stack sixty style house in Playa del Rey. Uh, views uh, outside across the ocean, outside of uh, Los Angeles. And after dinner, we, they have a whole different level for the bar. And we would go down to the bar and Buzz was there and, and was teasing Bob because he has a trophy case. And one of his trophies was, was a trophy for landing on the moon. And Buzz was like, wait, I thought I was the one that landed on the moon. Why did you get a trophy for it? And, and Bob responded, well, because I did the orbit for it and you wouldn't have made it to the moon without my orbit. So thank you very much. <laughs> so that's... That's one of my stories about Buzz Aldrin. Uh, and it got to meet his uh, first wife too at the time. They were both quite the party animals to put it mildly. That takes us then 10 years, jump ahead to the third International High Frequency Gravitational Wave Workshop in Chengdu. Uh, this time, 10 years have gone by and uh, the Russians have gone quiet about their work. And so they're being a little more distant. They did not attend uh, the third IHFGW workshop. And uh, the Chinese even invited the Iranians, three Iranians. The Iranians all uh, canceled for personal reasons, whatever that means. So it was just the Chinese and Americans. Uh, and so, uh, but, but we were very well treated. Uh, it was a very well organized conference. Um, it was, they were very gracious hosts. There was a hotel literally on the premises of the university, a university hotel. And they, they throw these elaborate dinners too. So it's, it's a fabulous opportunity if you get a chance to 
visitors well, to their workshops. Now, Gary, I, I might be jumping ahead, but by this time, by 2017, if I remember correctly, the Chinese had already built at least one, maybe two different types of gravitational wave detectors, right? They, they had plans on the drawing board. So far as I know, they had never actually built them. Mm. Uh, that's, a, that's definitely a question for Bob Baker. As I'll point out in some future slides here, Bob was very much more in touch with them than I was. So, so here's the group, uh, group photo. And uh, for the audio version, I will describe maybe 30 people, 25 of which are Chinese. So the vast majority of the attendees here were from China. A small American contingent uh, of five. Uh, the other thing, if you have the visual, is you will notice in the American contingent, this guy wearing a yellow hat. That would be Andrew Beckwith. He's, he's not super into fashion, you know, <laughs> orthogonal to fashion, to the fashion era. era. Uh, also Bob Baker with Bonnie and myself. And um, I'm forgetting there's a, another gravitational researcher from Brownsville, Texas, a professor from Brownsville who was there. Mm. Probably sent to keep an eye on us. <laughs> there's always one. <laughs> And a little bit, I haven't talked about Andrew before, a little bit about Andrew, uh, a well-known crank. He is a good friend, but he is always got a reputation for being outspoken. He was literally famous in the early days of the internet for Beckwithisms. Uh, and so back in the era of news groups, when the internet was first being born, his Be Beckwithisms were, were infamous. Uh, many phrases such as kook of the month club or sheer nutball power aren't attributed, but they should be attributed to Andrew because he was the first one to use these phrases. Uh, very creative with the English language, also very creative in physics, almost to a flaw, uh, because his, his work is scattered all over the place. But like any uh, shotgun, sometimes a few are spot on and right on the mark. Uh, there's just a few, uh, including Schneider geometry, okay? Uh, and then ensuring the existence of vacuum energy. I don't know who would sell such an insurance policy, maybe Lloyds of London, but I don't know that insuring is quite the right word. And I think- it, one scene, Yeah, I think he meant with an E, right? Insuring, but- Yeah, and one C in vacuum, but Andrew would come back and say, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Here he is photobombing the bakers. Uh, part of the fun on these trips is to go to the cultural exhibits, which are are, are offered, but not insisted upon. So we were able to hit some of the local museums. I searched in vain for pictures of our luncheons together and I was not able to find them. I know I had at least three. Uh, so this instead is a picture of Bob at a, on a different trip visiting uh, at one of these Chinese, elaborate Chinese dinners, dish after dish, uh, when you're hosted uh, on one of these. Uh, another, another trip by Bob. Uh, Bob was very active uh, between, like really in the 2000s, I would say, be between the 2000s and summing up in the 2017 trip. And he went to China quite a lot and he, he became something of a, a celeb in the area of gravitational waves over there to the point where at one time he even had an audience of like um, 400 attendees. Uh, in China, and this is, uh, he was on the stage after that talk with some of the principal investigators, in, including you'll see on the right, Fang Yuli. So this was an era where we were worried about Chinese influence, and uh, there was a lot of concern um, about people doing work with the Chinese. So I was, I literally would, would get meetings with uh, counterintelligence people uh, from three-letter three letter agencies, and also, finally, the cases referred to the FBI, and the FBI was literally, Bob doesn't want to talk to us. Should we worry about Bob? Will you talk to us? I'm like, yeah, I'll talk to you. Being young and stupid, I didn't realize there's no such thing as an off, off the record discussion when you're talking to the FBI. Everything's on the record, right? So that, that I think, is the reason Bob didn't want, to be, didn't want to meet with him, not because he had anything to hide. So I'm like, Bob is basically teaching them physics. I mean, unless teaching physics is illegal now, you know, he's probably not doing any harm. And he's probably learning a lot more than they learned from us, right? Because they were spending a lot of people power on this problem. And we had very little, if any, interest on this. So I think, I think it's really good that Bob was going over there, finding out what was happening and uh, collaborating, at least in that sense, collaborating with them. Uh, so I think the, the case was dropped. Uh, I think what finally ultimately dropped the case was 
it came to a head with a summer meeting of the Jasons. Jasons, for those not familiar, is a, is a, is a summer advisory group uh, formed by scientists that, that are good in their field. And this particular advisory group included a bunch of uh, people good at general relativity. And they decided that what we were doing in, in terms of, of investigating hypercontinued gravitational waves was utterly and completely harmless and could never be weaponized and probably would never even work. So because it was such out there tech, I think you know that's they essentially dropped the case that Bob was doing anything wrong. We do still stay in touch with the Chinese group. Uh, they send Bob and I and the rest of the people who attend uh, their workshops Christmas cards every year. They're they're pretty elaborate. They have gravitational themes and things. So I, I look forward to getting these every year. I, they're really special to me. They're really uh, interesting, and it's it's a nice gesture that they haven't forgotten about us. And they want to continue a relationship. And I, I do hope that in the interest of peace, that we continue to work together and that should this Ukraine thing blow over, that the Russians re-engage. The sad ending to the Russian engagement with us was uh, at Marcel Grossman, the 15th Marcel Grossman, which I think was right about 2017 or 2018. And Rodenko was there with a presenter and Rodenko's presenter cut into Andrew Beckwith's time. Andrew got all upset complained to the chair, Ruffini, about it. And I don't know um, what, if anything, came of it, but clearly there were hurt feelings. Rodenko left early. So I hope that um, after that blows over and after the Ukraine thing is settled, that uh, we can all work together again. So in the meantime, I did want to uh, end this, this survey with um, a dedication to Lena Grischuk. Uh, the Ukrainians pronounce it Ruschuk. Uh, the G is almost silent. And they did recently a documentary on him. It's just a short five minute documentary, very touching, a very good summation of his life and his work. And I included uh, in the slides, if you want to distribute them later, um, Tim, a link to that video that has not had nearly enough views as it deserves. So with that, I will, I will end and uh, ask if you have any follow up or anything like that. Wonderful. Well, yeah, Gary, I, let me thank you again. Let me thank you so much for presenting this today. It's wonderful to have that history. It's wonderful to be able to walk through that and yeah, understand. I, mean, I didn't want the history to be lost because this was a really formative time when we, we took an area that was almost pseudoscience and hopefully we got enough scientific backing uh, with people like uh, Lena Grischuk and Feng Yu Li that it's on solid scientific ground now. So I, it, I felt like it was a, a piece, a little piece of history that deserved to be told. Oh, yeah. And some of those are major scientific first. Paul Murad and I actually followed up. This would be uh, probably about a year, year and a half ago now. We were trying to track down the uh, the VHS footage from the 2003 MITRE conference. That would have been really interesting. Yeah. And, you know, and they did film it. They had film of oh, all yeah. of it. Oh, yeah. I remember cameras there. Yeah. We ended up calling MITRE, and they they had they actually had a research library and digging through old files, but she couldn't find the tapes. So, mm. you know... Yeah, the texts are missing. Hmm. <laughs> well, I, I, you know, I think, I think in, in their case, uh, older material like that tends to get kind of recycled, right? So I think it ended up in the circular file. But yeah, and, and there's only so much storage space, uh, and so after ten years or so, that might be it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah, but still, yeah, all of this material is truly historic. And I, I have a feeling that you know, high frequency gravitational waves, as time progresses, that the work. That, that you've done, the work that this team has done, this is foundational material, right? That people will build off of. And I hope so, I hope it's not forgotten. Um, I think it really is worth pursuing. And I, I know it's, it's extremely uh, weak signals right now, but they thought SATCOM would be impossible, at least GeoSATCOM, because you know 200 or 300 dB of loss sounds ridiculous, 30 orders of magnitude, We're, we can never do that. So with gravitational wave, it's like 50 orders of magnitude, that doesn't mean we can't do it. It just means it's difficult. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, you know, it, it'd be, I mean, the penetration through the Earth's core and things like that, right? So, you there's know, value. for it, it, yeah, there's value and it has communications potential also. And for communications, you don't need a strong signal. You don't need to move things. You just need right. to be able to detect and generate signals. So, yeah, my interest is always calm, not, not propulsion. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's a, a lot more achievable, a lot more achievable. Gary, thank you again, sir. Of course, I, yeah, I, always a pleasure, Tim. Thanks for having me. Thanks again.